rejuvenate and edify together. Okay. We're going to talk about identifying principles that reveal God in art. Art is the interpretation of the great reality, eternal realities of life. Um, and as soon as the artist tries to embody the greatest feelings and aspirations of the human, he gets on biblical ground. Art deals with the eternal and the spiritual and is the incarnation of God's eternal beauty. Close quote from Stowbridge Archive. The three principles today that we're going to look at and be revealed of God are the power of creation, the beauty in truth, and the symbolism of the divine in art. So hopefully you'll see some new artwork and maybe some that you're familiar with throughout this presentation. Here is Walter Rain, an LDS contemporary artist who's still living today, Jehovah creating the earth. Notice that this is Jesus in the very act of creating. There is a visual energy and almost heat that radiates off the painting that helps us imagine the intensity of organizing the matter to form the earth. Quote, our divine creator spoke into existence all things. He formed the earth and he formed man and in him breathed the breath of life. Moses 6, 63 says, And behold, all things have their likeness, and all things were created and made to bear record of me. We see that he is our divine creator, and all things that we see are from him. So here's some of his creations, and they are, these are photographs. The creations of the earth often inspire the artist to create after the manner and image of God in his handiwork. Some of the principles of art that we study here at American Heritage School are balance, contrast, proportion, pattern, rhythm, unity, and variety. Coupled with the principles are the elements of art. Line, shape, color, value, texture, form, and space. In these photographs, you can see line, you can see shape, you can see all of these elements. The elements and principles of design originated with God in creation and are the building blocks with which the artist creates. So here is com a compilation of all the principles and elements in one majestic painting by Albert Beardstadt, one of the foremost German-American painters in the 19th century. He loved large-scale painting, and at the time that was not very popular. He was ridiculed by how big his canvases were. But, and I quote from Stonebridge Archive again, our Lord's creative nature is revealed to us through scripture and in creation. We need only gaze about us, observing creation, to see his divine qualities of beauty, balance, variety, detail, unity, and order. Likewise, an artist's creative expression reflects the Lord in the artist and should glorify him. One of our prophets has told us that everyone can create. I'd like to share this video with you from President Uchtdorf on that very subject of creation. The desire to create is one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul. backgrounds or abilities, we each have an inherent wish to create something that did not exist before. Everyone can create. You don't need money, position, or influence in order to create something of substance or beauty. You might say, I'm not the creative type. If that is how you feel, think again. And remember that you are spirit daughters of the most creative being in the universe. Isn't it remarkable to think that your very spirits are fashioned by an endlessly creative and eternally compassionate God? Think about it. Your spirit body is a masterpiece, created with a beauty, function, and capacity beyond imagination. Spirit, the 
greater your capacity to create. I love that last quote. The more you trust and rely upon the Spirit, the greater your capacity to create. You do that here at American Heritage School every day. You create smiles. You create a classroom. You create learning experiences for these youth. These are my greatest masterpieces. These are my four children, Isaac, Aaron, Elise, and Chloe. And it is my privilege to have been a co-creator with my Heavenly Father to bring these spirits to the earth. Um, they are part of his work and his glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And I truly believe our greatest creations are one another and our relationships and our families. Beauty like our families can be beautiful when there's love at home. Our beauty is the truth and is the highest form of righteousness. Our is revealed in its most beautiful form when it glorifies God in beauty and in truth. These are stargazer lilies by an artist named Laurel Bushman. And I quote from Christ and the Fine Arts by Cynthia Pure Mall. Beauty is the highest form of righteousness. Beauty and truth are not separated in God's world, and they ought not to be in human thought. God, who gave as much care to painting a lily as to forming the eternal hills, joined truth and beauty in holy union. And what God has joined together, man ought not attempt to put asunder, because beauty has a moral value for truth. One of the greatest... Um, Photographers of our time was Ensel Adams, and he often quoted this Gaelic mantra. This is the Tetons in the Snake River, one of my favorite places on earth. It says, quote, I know that I am one with beauty and that my comrades are one. So here's unity. Let our souls be mountains. Let our spirits be stars. Let our hearts be worlds. Rembrandt was also a very celebrated painter in his day, and still to this day he's celebrated. He was one of the painters of the Dutch Golden Age. And it says, because the arts are channels to the soul, they are healing instruments to many children. The child who struggles with classroom learning often finds comfort in the art class, where his stronger abilities have expression and affirmation. Rembrandt often etched, this is an etching, where he painstakingly learned the skills of acid and stone to cut into and ink these stones to make these wonderful impressions. As he was a young man, Rembrandt looked for the dramatic. The scriptures were an excellent source of this dramatic with tension and movement in every story. But as he matured as an artist, Rembrandt became the servant to the word of God. He no longer placed himself between that world board and the spectator, nor directed attention to his technical devices and the skill of, of his means of expression. He wanted to let the gospel speak for itself. Therein lies the beauty of mastering an art form and portraying the word of God through art. Carl Block, which many of you saw his exhibit, BYU, breathtaking exhibit, uh, is a, another famous artist from the Dutch era, and he was influenced by Rembrandt at the time, learned from him. It says, the universal love of beauty is one of the resources human life that Christianity ought to pervade with its spirit and claim as its own. It is to this instinctive love of the beautiful that the artist makes his appeal and gets, therefore, a wider hearing for the truth he presents in this universally loved Again, that's Cynthia Moss from Christ and the Fine Arts. Uh, Carl Block was born in Copenhagen in the 1600s, and his parents wanted, to, wanted him to be a respectable person and be someone in the Navy, but his heart was in art. And he had an interest.
interest in drawing and went to study in Italy and loved the, the landscapes of the Netherlands. And this painting is called Suffer the Children. And from Matthew 19, verses 13 through 14, it says, Then were there brought unto him little children, and his disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Little children naturally want to create. They naturally love the beautiful and the visual. And that is what we cultivate here at American Heritage. We don't want them to lose that desire to create beautiful. Here is a wonderful vase, very uh, prized vase from South Korea called the Vase of a Thousand Cranes. It's one of their national treasures that they protect. And pottery to me is a powerful symbol of, of uh, the Lord's hand in our lives. In the book of Jeremiah, it has an instance where the, the Lord wanted Jeremiah to learn from a potter. And it says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. And then here's the moral. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not, can, cannot I do with you as this potter? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. The children that we teach, the youth that we teach, are in the Lord's hands, and they are being shaped by what we teach and what we testify of. And these art pieces testify of the skill and determination. It's not easy to get a vase two feet tall on the wheel I tried and <laughs> failed. But it is a wonderful work to see and to, to observe the height of craftsmanship through the power that God gives an artist to create. So symbols of the divine is our last topic. Behold, a type was raised up in the wilderness that whosoever would look upon it might live, and many did look and live. Alma 3319. This is a, a, a Judith Murr from the LDS Art Kit. Uh, she painted this to depict that wonderful story of look to God and live. The brass serpent that Moses was, chose, was told to create and put on a staff symbolizes the Savior on the cross. And we are to look to him as the, our symbol to live. Judith, uh, this artist, was uh, born in California, and she studied at BYU in the 1970s and received her, her degrees there and became a, a, a renowned, active artist, and she still resides here in Utah today. Here is a stained glass window of Christ and the Lamb, another very typical but profound symbol of Christ is the Lamb. President Packer says, spiritual truths are sometimes very difficult to teach. The most conclusive certification of man's intelligence is his ability to recreate in symbolic form the world in which he lives. <coughs> Symbols are very difficult to create, but they have power. And because of that power, um, the Lord wants us to use them in righteous ways. Stained glass windows in and of themselves show through the light of Christ and are beautiful to behold. This one is from a detail in the Church of England. Another artist is Caravaggio. This is the calling of St. Matthew. And the light, again, through this is a symbol of Christ. And I quote, the beam of light which enters the picture from the direction of a real window, like a window to the soul, expresses in the blink of an eye the conversion of St. Matthew, the hinge on which his testimony will turn, with no flying angels, parting clouds, or other artifacts. It's a simple painting, even though the dress in this painting is not typical of the real time period, it's typical of Caravaggio's time period, and thus he's trying to relate this story and make it modern to the viewer. That light is symbolic in this of his, of St. Matthew's conversion. And if any of you have seen that light come in a youth's eyes when they have received that testimony, it is miraculous and marvelous. And there's no trumpets. It's pure and clean 
architectural symbol that we know and love is been a part of my family history since its creation and many generations of my family have been buried there and it is covered just like our Mount Timpanogos temple it's covered in symbols the one I want to point to you is Ursa Major or the Big Dipper and Hugh Nibley says to have this particular constellation a Dharma temple is most appropriate for as Hugh Nibley has stated many times the temple is the place where one takes his bearings on the universe and in the eternities both in time and space unquote as that constellation in the heavens is always pointing unto the North Star, so this temple points unto God and indicates to the saints that therein they may learn more perfectly how to walk in the way of the Lord and how to gain an exaltation in his presence. Artists, as you know, took 40 years to create every stone and put everything in its rightful place. The majesty of this building and of every artful detail of master stone cutters is immense and it always is awe inspiring and humbling to me to know the rudimentary of their tools but the courage of their heart and the ability with their hands is amazing. Here's the next one of in our simple collection and this is called the Fountain of the Great Lakes. Those of you who love geography, I threw this piece in there because um, it symbolizes a lake formation. This is by Laredo Taft, one of his most famous, best-known works. And it depicts five women arranged in the same way that the water flows through them through the Great Lakes. Note that the Great Lakes water flow starts in Lake Superior. Whoops. Superior starts at the top and flows down through the sea level and continues eastward through each lake until it reaches Lake Ontario and then passes into the St. Lawrence River. This might, ne might not necessarily have a spiritual symbol, but this definitely has a symbol of God's creation taken from geography in the land of nature and put into a symbolic form as the water flows the same way as the Great Lakes. Pretty ingenious. These next symbols are abstract symbols. And a lot of times abstract art gets a bad reputation because you can't immediately understand it. That doesn't make, obviously, doesn't make it bad if you don't understand something, right? So these are two symbols from uh, John Robinson, his more well-known works are for the Olympics. He's done a lot of figures in bronze of Olympic athletes and gymnasts that are all over the world. But these are two of his symbolic ones that are more, that are less figurative and definitely more uh, symbolic. So this one on the left is a bunch of squares. It's very large. He's done it in bronze and wood and he's taken the idea of the square from the Chinese, and the square in Chinese means the earth and the creation. So this is actually called creation. This one is two huge bronze links. It stands as tall as I am. And it is called the Bonds of Friendship. It was commissioned to give <coughs> to nations to close the strife between two nations and thus create a link between them in friendship instead of strife. We also in LDS culture have a strong symbol with links with the with the sealing power and linking families and sealing them to our Savior. So not only does the artist have an intent for his symbols, but we as a viewer can come and look at it and put our own symbols to it as well. Next is another favorite by Jean Vermeer, again, a Dutch artist. And uh, this is replete, just like the temple, replete with symbols. 
Here we have pearls and gold that she's weighing in a balance. That balance is empty. But above her head is a painting of Christ's last judgment. And so art critics have argued back and forth what the meaning is. But it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. It's what you think the meaning is. But when I saw this painting for the first time in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., I was pushing a double stroller with two small toddlers trying to see as much as I could of the National Art Gallery and give, give sippy cups and treats and they'd be quiet in the art gallery. And here I was and I stood in front of it and this painting small. It's, it's very, it's just like an eight by 10, but the detail is so fine. And there I was trying to balance a double stroller and all this stuff and this painting hit me with such force because this woman who could possibly be a mother is trying to balance the world and balance the spiritual in her life. And I think that's the pull for all of us. We're always trying to balance the worldly pulls with the spiritual world pulls and conquer with the spiritual. We want to come off conquer. So this has a lot of meaning to me. Walter Rain, another, he was the one who did the Jehovah Creates the Earth. This is a symbolic, one of his feasts. This is, he is not here. Um, another collection from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the church's aesthetic is that they want us to, they want to promote these symbols in their most realistic form. But as we view this, we don't see just white cloth on stone. We know the story.